Hello my friends and welcome back to my soft pink Muppet hands. Sorry I was gone last week, but this week we're back with the Edo G1030 colored pencils color dictionary. We have some brushes and one of my palettes containing Paul Rubens and Daniel Smith paints that I am trying to use up so that I can empty this out for other paints because I already have my preferred palette set up with those and today we're going to be painting a landscape study of this scene from Breath of the Wild of the Master Sword in the Lost Woods. So the first step we're going to do here is we're going to take this kneaded eraser and we're going to lightly erase the outline I did here so that we can line it in colored pencils instead. Uh, and then we're going to watercolor this. So we're going to be starting with this set, which is the light grayish tone set. I do really like the colors in here. They're very muted and I find them good for landscapes like this. Um, I don't really use colored pencils to color, so I don't know if I'll ever do a full review of these. I only ever really use them for this kind of quote unquote line art um, at, to use as a guide for my paintings. Um, I find coloring with colored pencils to be very difficult on my hands, so I don't really do it very much. But yeah, uh, I will say that these are very nice for waxed based pencils. Um, they do also erase lightly. They are not advertised or meant to be erasable pencils, but if you use an eraser on them, you'll see that it will come up a little bit. So that is helpful for my process that may be more frustrating for yours. I did also find myself kind of wishing I had more of the pencils out of this set. Um, this is, I think, set B of the Yodoji 10 pencils, and I'll have links to these in the description, which will be affiliate links, which means that I get a small kickback if you decide to get them. Uh, but I am not sponsored by the product, so I am just giving my own opinions here. Um, there are two sets of these little like book style Idoji 10 translates to color dictionary in Japanese. So the packaging is made to look like little books, which I think is really cute. But at the same time, um, I feel like only having half of the colored pencils is limiting my ability to really get a good impression of them just because the color selection is limited and I find colored pencils to be difficult for me to use when I have a limited palette, which is funny because Pretty much every other art supply I use, I prefer a limited palette. With colored pencils, I feel like I need every color available, otherwise I can't make it work. So yeah, all this to say, I like these colored pencils. I think part of it is just that I like the packaging so much because it's so friggin' cute. <laughs> um, but if you don't have these or don't have access to fancy colored pencils or don't want to buy fancy colored pencils, you absolutely do not need these. This step would work fine with Crayolas. Uh, I'm just getting a nice base down and I prefer to use wax-based colored pencils like Crayolas or the Edo G10 when I am doing these kinds of line art guides for my paintings because I find that the pigment stays still more so than oil-based pigments when water is applied. I think this is mostly because it's not supposed to blend as well. Like wax-based ones are harder to blend, oil-based are built to blend, so they just move a lot more easily. And uh, yeah, we're gonna move on from this step. I did a little quick erase after that, but it was pretty well in the paper at this point. I was pressing down pretty hard. So the pigments are firmly in place and I'm ready to start painting. So as I mentioned, this is a Daniel Smith Paul Rubens palette. Uh, it's the same as my main palette. It's just a bigger one. Um, I was experimenting with a lot of different palettes when I got these paint sets to see what setup I liked the most. And I ended up not really liking this one, but I have it in my studio to use now so that I can use these paints up and eventually either give this palette away to someone uh, that could use it more than I could or I can uh, put different paints in here as I get others. It's not that I don't like the palette, it actually has a lot of mixing room, it's a nice palette, it's just very large for my desk in my office, which is where I'm usually painting, but for my studio desk where I have more room, it's perfect. So I only end up using about four colors in the background of this piece, and you'll see that there are a lot of areas that I'm gonna start out with these light green washes that will end up other colors like yellow and brown. Um, I'm trying to keep the piece kind of unified, so I'm using, I believe, the Paul Rubens Hooker's Green for most of the greens here. The other colors I use are Daniel Smith's Buff Titanium, the Indian Yellow from the Paul Rubens set, the Sepia from the Paul Rubens set, and then I believe way later I start using indigo around the time I start painting the Master Sword. Master Sword is a mix of indigo and a Paul Rubens violet. 
um, and also a turquoise and the black color that came in the Paul Rubin set. I don't actually have that in the palette, but I had some squeezed out onto the mixing area from an old painting. So I used that for the gray of the Master Sword mixed with some turquoise. So yeah, I ended up with about four colors in the background and then a little bit of indigo for these foreground dark washes. And the Master Sword has four colors as well, and it is pretty distinct from the rest of it because the only color that they have in common is that indigo. And in the foreground, that's very much mixed with the green tones. Um, and this helps the Master Sword stand out like it does in the original composition, the screenshot or official art that I was referencing. I kind of was going back and forth between the two. And it keeps the piece also feeling cohesive because they do both have that indigo in common. So it is both cohesive in that sense and also the Master Sword stands out because it has all of these turquoise and purple tones that are absent from the rest of the piece. But yeah, I wanted to give you guys some general tips for painting landscapes because I know backgrounds are something that intimidate a lot of artists. I am not by any means a landscape painter. And I think that makes me well qualified to talk to people who are afraid to paint backgrounds. Um, you can do it even if it is not your core competency. So let's go over some of the things that have been helpful for me in learning how to paint backgrounds in landscapes like this. So my first tip is to just start doing backgrounds. You don't have to put them on your pictures. You can just do studies like this for, you know, video game screenshots, any kind of landscape that you like. Do studies of artwork from other artists that you like. Um, something that really helped me with figuring out how I like to do backgrounds actually was watching people mimic Bob Ross tutorials and seeing the different ways that their styles influenced the end result. Uh, Bob Ross is just a great resource in general for feeling like you can do art and he's right, you can do it and he should say it. Obviously I don't paint in a Bob Ross style, I don't use oil paints and I don't do hyper realism at all, but it's very helpful in seeing how he breaks down the shapes to figure out how you like doing your own nature backgrounds. My second tip goes hand in hand with the first, and it is, if the first step is practice, my second tip is use references a lot. Um, heavily use references. Take pictures at your house. Take pictures on walks at parks. Uh, also, you can do studies like this from video games. I like to build environments within The Sims 4 specifically, like houses and even neighborhoods and interiors, bedrooms and stuff. And I reference those all the time for my backgrounds. I'll probably do a whole video at some point just showing like how powerful a tool The Sims 4 can be, especially if you're playing on PC and you have custom content. Once you figure out how to use the camera tool, you can really set up references at any angle you need and then just insert your characters into a scene. So that is my second tip. So step one is practice and that's everyone's least favorite tip, but it's really just, you're not gonna learn how to do it until you start doing it. So just start doing it and give yourself permission to do it badly. Um, a lot of my early background work is really bad and you'll never see it because it just lives in my old sketchbooks. You don't have to make everything a finished piece for studying. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my first two tips. My third is to study and draw from life in actual environments. One of my favorite places to do that actually is I live really close to Disney World. So I will occasionally, when I have gone there in the past, I've brought my sketchbooks and just a couple of like highlighters or uh, even just taking pictures while I'm there of interesting looking environments because they've built environments that are meant to look interesting by other artists that are eye-catching and have great contrast and lighting. So I like to take pictures inside the rides. I've gotten some great ones on um, Pirates of the Caribbean just in the ride queue and it makes it way more interesting than just waiting in line and staring at nothing to go ahead and you know doodle or just take pictures to take home with you and draw later. And even if you don't live near Disney World, like I do, <laughs> I mean, I didn't used to, I moved here pretty recently. Um, you can take pictures at aquariums or arboretums or just the park or just sit at the park and draw and paint. I have a lot of sketchbooks with a ton of just, I would go to a public park and I would sit at one of the tables and I would just sit there and paint whatever was in front of me. And that's going to help you a lot with understanding the different shapes and the shadows and how they interplay with each other. And again, this is another very boring tip. I don't really have any life hacks for this. This is just a 
you know, you can apply these tips to basically any kind of art you want to learn. Um, and nobody likes hearing practice, practice, use references, and study as the quick tip. But you'll get better at it the more you do it, and you will get good faster than you think you will. It doesn't take that long to get okay at a skill. Like, you know, they say it takes 10,000 hours to master a skill. And that is, you know, equivalent to 10 years of study full time. But it only takes like, I don't know, 30, 40 hours to get okay at stuff. And remember that you don't have to do things so well that it impresses other professionals and people who are way ahead of like where you're at on your art journey that have been doing it for 50 years because most people aren't professional artists. So just by the numbers, most of the people who will be looking at your art will not be ridiculously talented artists themselves. And even just putting in the effort to put in backgrounds and make background paintings and do landscape studies, a lot of people find really impressive because they're too afraid to start doing it themselves. So yeah, I really just encourage you to go give it a shot and let the first couple be terrible and don't worry too much about getting it right the first time. Just focus on learning instead of becoming incredible and eventually you'll be pretty okay at it. Like I am by no means, like I said, a landscape painter at all. I am not great at painting environments, but I do it anyway and I think it comes out okay and people seem to like my work and yeah, that's it. That's how you trick everyone into thinking you're way better at art than you actually are, is just by trying things and taking risks and experimenting. So yeah. Oh, another one is actually contrast and that it's a lot easier to color a background for me than it is to draw one. So I found that when I stopped trying to do my backgrounds the same way I did my foregrounds were like, you know, a lot of people and sometimes myself will do like a line art and then we'll do a coloring piece and whatever after we've drawn a character and worked the sketch to the point where we're happy with it. Um, I find it a lot easier with a background to sketch out roughly where everything is and then let either my paint or my markers do the rest of the work. Something that is different between painting or drawing a landscape and a person a, or a character is that you're gonna have to fill in areas of color that are much larger and doing that in the sketch portion is both difficult and a waste of time because you're not going to see that in the end result and you already can see where it needs to go once you've sketched out the rough shape of something. So just do a rough sketch like I did here. Um, you saw how detailed it was. It wasn't very detailed at all. And then just let your tools do the hard work for you, if that makes sense. Like use a big brush or a marker to fill in large areas of shapes and things so you can get that contrast quickly. Because in the sketching stage, your background is going to look worse just because there's not going to be a ton of detail in it. And there shouldn't be. Like, you'll be wasting time and shooting yourself in the foot to do it. I remember when I was first trying to draw trees, and this was when I was like, I don't know, nine, eight, when I was a little kid, I would sit there and draw hundreds of leaves because I could see that trees were made of a bunch of leaves. Don't think of it as the individual objects making up the thing. Just think of everything as shapes. And that's a very basic art fundamental skill. Uh, look for the shapes, look for where the light and the shadow change from each other. So like where a shadow is cast, find where those lines are and then block in the shadow with sometimes I'll just like use a dark gray marker and a light gray marker. I have those in my little sketch bag and you're gonna have a much easier time just working with the shapes as opposed to trying to draw what the object actually looks like in real life to you. Um, and this is obviously not the case if you do a lot of like pen and ink and that's your forte is doing complicated art with just white and black, sure. But this is for people who are doing art at least similarly to how I'm doing it here, or at least are trying to do something similar. Um, use your tools to make your life easier. Don't try to do a scene like this all in pencil because it's gonna take a hundred years and the end result probably won't be satisfying to look at for you because you only have one tool to use. So I like doing my backgrounds. A lot of times I carry around like 
highlighters or mild liners, which are a Zig brand. They have, it's a line of highlighters, but they're not like neon. They're cute little pastel colors and they have both brush and chisel tip versions available. I got a pack of those and I use those to do studies all the time. Um, I've actually done entire pieces with them. I really enjoy using them and they don't pill up the paper like water-based markers tend to do. Um, and I just use those to block in my colors. Like keep in mind your big shapes that you're trying to block in. Don't worry about getting a ton of detail into your backgrounds, especially if you're going to have a character in the foreground or something like that. Um, it's really just all you need is the shapes. All you need is the impression that something is there and people will respond to that if that's not the focus of the piece. They'll be like, oh wow, what a cool background that this character is in front of holding a cool sword. I do a lot of D&D &D art. Um, but yeah, just don't let it intimidate you. Uh, go find the biggest landscape and pick a fight with it on the first day and then everyone will know not to mess with you. And that is how you paint backgrounds. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. Do that with all of your art. Do that with all of your skills. Nobody makes the rules but you. Life is short. Do what you want. Uh, yeah. So we're getting towards the end of this painting. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that next week the video is going to feature this painting again, but I'm going to be showing you how to convert a traditional art piece like this into an enamel pin design. So I actually was painting this with that end goal in mind. The pin itself is not going to be a square and obviously isn't going to have a lot of these watercolor details, but I'll be showing you how to, in Photoshop and Illustrator, convert your traditional pieces to something that you could send to an enamel pin manufacturer to have made into pins. Uh, enamel pins are really big right now and I wanted to share my experience with y'all and I know that as a traditional artist myself I used to struggle a lot with making my art marketable and turning it into merchandise and stuff and I think over time I've gotten pretty decent at it so I want to give you guys those tips in case you have a similar issue of well I do all of my art on paper and even though I scan it how do I make this into something that isn't just a print uh, really all it takes is a little bit of planning and if you don't do the planning it takes a little bit of creative thinking Thinking, but you can do it and I'm gonna show you how I do it. So I hope y'all will look forward to that and that that will be useful for you. This is the part where I tell you to like this video and subscribe if you don't want to miss the next one. Uh, yeah, so I want to go over what I'm actually doing here in the painting real quick. Um, so I'm adding really small details right now, but specifically I'm adding little bits of grass and additional shadows. Uh, I find that adding little bits of grass silhouettes make a painting have a lot more depth. So obviously they're bigger in the front where they would be closer to the viewer. And I'm also putting a few in the back selectively and I'll come back in here with colored pencils later and do a few more that are finer than I was able to do with my brushes or rather I could have done them with the brushes but I didn't feel like it because it would have been a pain in the butt. So now the colored pencils are coming back. We are done with paint. Paint is canceled. It's over and this is the deep tone set. I was actually kind of disappointed with this set. I found that even though they were darker than the set I was using earlier. They were still lighter than most of the pencils I'm used to using in my Prismacolor and Faber-Castell sets. And even I have other darker Tombow Edo G10 pencils that I bought open stock, just like one or two at a time that are darker than these. So I don't know if there's another set that is darker than those, but I was kind of disappointed with those. I ended up pulling out the pastels to also pump up the yellows and the turquoise colors here because my paints for those are, they're very transparent as watercolors tend to be, and they were getting lost next to the darker colors. I don't really know how I feel about these colored pencils at this point, honestly. Like, obviously, I think the packaging is really cute, but I think part of me was a little taken in by that um, because I don't really like the color selection here very much. There are some colors I found very useful and then a lot of colors I found basically useless. Um, and while I like the pencils themselves, they're a very nice wax-based pencil, uh, the color selection may just not be for me. Like the quality of the product is obviously fine. I think just for what I need them for, these pencils don't fit my workflow very well. The other sets may, but I'm a little hesitant to spend money on an art supply where I have already bought it once and not particularly liked the result. Uh, so I think I'm just gonna stick with the pencils that I use for everything. Uh, you'll see here I'm pulling out some Faber Castells and a Prismacolor erasable colored pencil just to finish up some of the darkest areas because there really were no darks in this Tombow set. 
that I got. So yeah, that is the finished piece. I'll leave a link below to where you can see it, uh, but here's the pan. And uh, next week we'll turn this into enamel pins. So like and subscribe, uh, check out the other videos if you want to keep listening to me talk forever. And I hope you have a wonderful day.